Megan, I think I'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone. I'm really pleased that you've joined me for this session on collaborative support for the open data life cycle. As we, um, as we get started, I, I'm keen to know a little bit more about who's in the room. And if, so if you uh, add your name, affiliation, um, your, where, you're, where you're tuning in from, um, your pronouns, social media handles, any other information about yourself that, that you'd like us to know, please add it in the Zoom chat. You can also add it to our collaborative notes document. Um, I uh, that's linked here and should be linked through the Kiko chat as well. Um, a reminder that by participating in this session, you're agreeing to adhere to the ESIP community participation guidelines, which are also linked from the notes document. Uh, and you can report any issues um, uh, at the link provided here as well. This session is being recorded and will be archived for future viewing. For the comfort of all the attendees, please do stay muted when you're not speaking, but you are welcome to ask any questions at any time by typing them into the chat box. I'll do my best to address things uh, expediently. Um, and there will be a couple of opportunities um, where I'll ask for, for participation, um, uh, where you can feel free to unmute and, um, and chime in with your thoughts. Are there any questions or concerns before we get started? Great. A little bit about me. Um, I'm the head of community engagement at Dryad. Dryad is an open publishing platform and community that's committed to the open availability and routine reuse of all research data. And we have deep roots in the earth science community. So I'm really, uh, it's, it's great to be here with, with all of you. Um, Dryad uh, is, uh, since our founding in 2008, we've curated and published nearly 50,000 data sets representing the work of nearly 200,000 researchers at nearly 70,000 institutions around the world. And our data sets are connected to research articles in over 1,200 leading academic journals. Um, I'm a trained librarian by background with an interest in advancing open and equitable scholarly communication. Um, uh, today, what uh, I hope you'll get out of this session are insights into how policies such as the White House Memorandum on Open Data affect the scholarly publishing landscape as it relates to data and, and how it impacts uh, researchers and the way that they manage and share their data, um, and develop a deeper understanding of the data life cycle and the importance of data curation and publishing for ensuring qual data quality and reusability. Um, reuse is going to be kind of central to what we talk about today. Um, it's a, it's kind of the point of open data, at least from our perspective at Dryad. Um, so, so keep that in mind as we as we go through the, the presentation and some collaborative exercises, um, thinking with, with that uh, kind of idea in mind of open data really facilitating data reuse. Um, our, a quick overview of, of how, I'll, how we'll structure our time together. Uh, I want to start just by taking a few minutes to talk about why this is a timely topic right now. Then we'll talk about what is the open data life cycle. And finally, we will um, uh, we will use uh, we'll we'll look at how each element of the data life cycle contributes to open science. Um, and we'll use Jamboard Google Jamboards to collaboratively brainstorm about how um, about each element. The open sharing of data underpinning research is essential to achieving the benefits of open science. New policies and guidance from federal agencies, um, including the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and the National Institutes of Health, among, among others, make clear that simple data sharing is no longer sufficient because the value of, of, uh, of data lies in the quality of, uh, because the value lies in the quality of the metadata and usability of published data. So the updated um, White House policy sets high expectations for federal agencies to improve research integrity uh, and re reproducibility 
by requiring immediate open deposit of data underlying scholarly research, instructing agencies to develop plans for, de for open deposit of data that's not associated with a publication, encouraging the use of trusted repositories, specifically those that align with the National Science and Technology Council's desirable characteristics of data repositories for federally funded research, and calling for all of these open outputs to be described with robust metadata, including author and co-author information, publication date, persistent identifiers, and other, other core um, elements. And the, the key, uh, one of the keys to, um, to the, uh, these policies is the idea that data, the data that is archived in compliance with these policies should be of sufficient quality to validate and replicate research findings. It should not only be made openly available and, and accessible or, pro or provided for access by other researchers, but that it should actually enable re reproducibility uh, and reuse. These policies have, have provided a renewed motivation for researchers to deposit data in trusted repositories, but moving beyond just compliance to publishing data that, that meets that intention of being suitable for, for reuse um, is, is, a, is a different, uh, is, is a much bigger task. Um, it requires uh, a lot of researcher education. It requires appropriate infrastructure that is designed for uh, for uh, data reuse uh, to to make data reuse possible, um, and it requires uh, it requires a lot of of skill in in curation and management to um, ensure that that data can actually meet this high bar. Um, in a 2022 survey, a survey this year administered by the data repository Figshare uh, of over 5,000 researchers, over 70% said their researcher is, their research is directly affected by a policy on data sharing. I'm wondering, our audience in the room, has your research been directly affected by a data sharing policy? That might be a, a, a funder policy or a publisher policy. Um, and so you can join the this poll uh, via Slido um, or using the QR code um, or at slido.com with this with this number. Looks like quite a few of you already have been required to to share your data as the result of of a, a policy in the past. So. Uh, another question that comes up for me is why is open data Im so important to research funders? Why is the White House paying attention to this? Why are our publishers requiring uh, open data? Why are uh, you know why is has this uh, become uh, such a, a an issue that's receiving so much attention? Um, I think the first one is that you know reusable open data provides evidence that supports research articles and enables experts to interrogate, validate, reproduce, and build upon new findings. So we're promoting scientific integrity and encouraging reproducibility um, by, uh, by providing open data. Um, here's just an example of you know, this, this idea that without raw data that's openly available, it's impossible for other scientists to, to reproduce findings um, and to, to, to validate one another's work. Open data also allows, uh, excel, can accelerate scientific discovery. We saw this extensively with the, the COVID-19, um, with the, the, the pandemic, um, that open sharing of research data, it was one of the ways in which we were able to make uh, light speed progress on developing vaccines and understanding a novel illness. Um, and this is COVID-19 is not the only example of, of the, the immense uh, benefits to, um, uh, to, uh, sharing, to sharing data for accelerating research. It helps scientists avoid doing new, new unnecessary experiments or time consuming experiments and being able to work with data that already exists. Um, and, uh, uh, and and potentially gain novel insights from from that data as well. Um, it promote uh, open data can promote innovation. Um, this uh, 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 oh, I'm sorry that uh, I have a couple of 
examples here of some data in Dryad that we have from the COVID-19 pandemic that was, you know, deposited, uh, you know, early on, you can see these were, were published in April of 2020, so making data available really rapidly and openly for other scientists to reuse and communicating information um, that, that was critical to responding to the pandemic. In terms of promoting innovation, um, this is just a a, a clip from, uh, from a McKinsey report that identified three trillion in economic value globally that could be generated each year through enhanced use of open data. So there are, there's innovation, there are economic benefits, uh, there's potential for uh, economic benefits that can come through um, industry use of open data uh, or through uh, you know, research, or research industry partnerships. Um, and finally, providing broad access to publicly funded research, in, include, in, increasing public trust in, um, in science and uh, giving uh, the, a broader public more, uh, more direct access to, the, uh, to what their taxpayer dollars are funding. So those are those are some of the things that I came up with. I'm wondering what you what your th thoughts are. I have another poll here. Um, can you think of other reasons why data sharing is important, or to put it another way, how does open how does data sharing make science better, um, whether that's faster or more um, uh, more more equitable, or however you want to define that? Some good ideas coming in. They re, you know. Uh, reiterating reproducibility, greater trust in the scientific process. It's the right thing to do, the you know, public good, increasing equity. Um, preventing unnecessary repetition. Um, potentially leading to novel insights that the original researchers may not have, have uh, anticipated. ensuring that, that the data is persistent, right? That it's not dependent on a, any single individual to, uh, uh, to, to be made available. Great thoughts, thank you for your participation. All right, so let's, let's talk about, uh, so we've talked a little bit about uh, why why data sharing is such a timely topic, why it's on people's minds, um, and why it's relevant to, to researchers. Um, uh, but I want to bring everyone's attention to, to the idea that, that sharing, um, or, or in this, uh, you know, in this, um, diagram sharing and dis dissemination is only one part of the research, the full research life cycle. And all of these parts are interconnected. So when, once we get to the point of sharing, we've already done a huge amount of work um, that is, is very much interconnected with the process and uh, the products of sharing. Um, so I wanna take a look at the data life cycle and how it can help us to understand how our actions in each stage contribute to policy compliance with, with the White House policy and others and, and data reusability in general. Um, there are many different versions of this diagram. Um, they all vary a little bit in the terminology, what each of these stages is called. Some of them are are more complex and some are more are simpler. Um, I like the relative simplicity of this one and it, it serves as a good um, framework for our discussion today. Uh, it includes the following elements, plan and design as the first stage in the life cycle, collect and create, analyze and collaborate, evaluate and archive, share and disseminate, and access and reuse. Um, I'm curious, and I'll uh, you can put your thoughts into the the Zoom chat for this one, um, and and I'll, or raise your hand if you'd like to if you have a comment. I know we haven't dug into the definitions of each of these phases, but does this life cycle look familiar to you from your own work? Does it reflect your research practices? 
Um, and are there elements of the data lifecycle that you don't see here that are familiar to you from your work? Any thoughts? I, I see a, a couple of comments coming into the into the chat. QC QA seems to be miss, missing. Great point. Um, cross cutting elements of documentation, metadata, and QC. A similar a similar thought. Um, possible, possibly kind of reorg, maybe these don't make sense quite in the order they're presented, I mean, maybe analyze and collaborate coming after evaluate and archive. But it seems, you know, overall, this, it, it, I'm not hearing uh, that this uh, seems completely unfamiliar uh, to your research processes. So um, for the rest of the session, we're going to talk about each of these elements and how they relate to creating and managing data that complies with funder policies, supports data reuse, and facilitates open science. For each element, I'll seed the conversation by giving a very brief overview and a few insights from our recommended practices at Dryad. Then we'll use Jamboards to think about three interrelated questions for each element. The first, we'll talk about roles and responsibilities, asking who's involved in this stage and what role do they play in supporting open practices. We'll talk about challenges, asking what are the barriers we encounter during this stage that make it difficult to adopt open practices. And we'll talk about outcomes, asking what happens when we do this stage well, what benefits do our open science practices have for us and our stakeholders. At the end, we'll be able to look across the Jamboards to identify the full range of stakeholders that's implicated in the entire uh, data life cycle, the challenges that they can help us work through, and the positive outcomes when we work through those challenges. Let's start with plan and design. What are some of the actions we take at this stage that support open science practices? Um, we, uh, the, you know, the obvious uh, the single most powerful thing we can do here, and I think the obvious one here, is creating a detailed data management plan. Creating a data management plan may be a funder requirement. It often is a funder requirement. Um, and constructing one, it sets you up for success in every subsequent stage of the data life cycle because it gives you a structure and it gives you a, uh, it gives you a structure for recording the types of documentation that will make it easy to, to describe your data for, for future sharing and reuse. It will help you to keep track of all of the data to make them, them, I won't say easy, but possible to package up for sharing, for archiving, sharing, and reuse. Um, and it will um, uh, establish the types of conventions that you need to, um, to keep things organized throughout the course of the project. So a, a, a data management plan, um, uh, describes it, some of the important elements there that implicate reuse uh, are describing the type of data that you're going to produce, thinking about things like the, the overall size or size of individual files that you anticipate generating, the types of data formats that you anticipate generating, um, and even things like the, the data elements that, that you'll be collecting and starting to define um, the, the different variables in your, um, in your study. Also things like information management practices. So establishing from the beginning file directory structures and naming conventions that will help to keep all of that information organized over the course of the study and, and allow you to package it up for, um, for uh, for submission to a repository or to archive uh, to archiving. 
We recommend using um, the MP tool, uh, which is a you know a free and open tool that helps you build out a, a structured and detailed data management plan. Um, and finally, uh, assigning roles for accountability, making sure that at each for for any actions that are associated with the data management plan, <clears throat> that there are designated individuals on the team who are responsible for ensuring um, that um, that uh, those are implemented and um, uh, that those are implemented. So I'm going to share a link to uh, to the. <clears throat> The Jamboard for this uh, for this uh, this uh, element um, in the chat, and I invite you to to join me there to um, collaboratively think about roles and stakeholders at this at the plan and design stage of the data of the data lifecycle, the challenges and the outcomes. You don't need to contribute to each one of these. If one one speaks to you more, one question speaks to you more than the others, you can you can choose where you uh, where your interest lies. I've seeded one one comment um, on a sticky note here, um, if uh, for some inspiration. The um, sticky notes are available in the left tab here. If you click on one, uh, you'll be able to write your comment directly directly there, and then move it around the board. So we'll take about um, three minutes, uh, three to three to five minutes, to um, to gather ideas here. There's anyone who has never used a Jamboard and needs a quick tutorial. Let us know. Should be able to click the little sticky note button on the left. Drag them around. And I'll note, Sarah, there's some really good comments in the chat also to make note of. Thanks for that comment, Steve. We um, often have it so that some of our federal partners can't create these uh, Jamboards or Google Docs, but usually they've been able to participate. So I appreciate you sharing that and apologies. If there's anything you want me to add, feel free to pop it in the chat and I'll make a sticky note for you. I'm seeing some really great ideas and thoughts appearing here. Would anyone like to comment on, on what they added or expand on, on what they added or, or ask a question about uh, something that they see on here? This is Monica on solid. I added the part about also in the chat about taking a step back. I think as career scientists, we forget the first step is observation. And we've got a lot of questions. We have a lot of data that's answering questions nobody asked except us. Um, and maybe if we sit back and just observe what's going on in the world, that can lead to better research questions, which can lead to better research plans and more actionable, more useful, more helpful data. So that the data we're putting up there is not just someone's particular research interest, but it sort of forces you to consider how does this fit within climate change or environmental health or the reaper, you know, just instead of putting science in a silo separate from society, step back and just see like how, what can I see about these streams that are affecting my community, so to speak. 
I wish we would spend more time there as we get further in our careers. I love that idea. And it's, you know, it's taking a step back and it's also, it's also thinking from the very beginning about that, the end of that data, data life cycle. So it's, you know, you're, you're starting from the very beginning, you're already starting to think, what are the, what are the outcomes here? Um, not just for my research, but for a, a much broader audience. Um, and what are the potential ways in which this might be, um, might be used and, um, and, and useful in society. Any other thoughts? Would anyone else like to expand on, on what they've added here or ask a question about any of the comments? I just love that we don't have enough space. This is definitely a sticky note, uh, set of sticky note fans. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm just catching up on, on reading and I'll, I'll give you all a chance to read a few more of these um, before we move on. I, I like the idea, I think, you know, kind of related to Monica's comment here that one of the stakeholders is the people who need the information uh, and which might include uh, people well beyond the, uh, the team that is collecting it. And I, uh, I think this, uh, you know, the comment that evolving technology means that data management plans have to be reevaluated and kept up to date on a on a regular basis is is a really good uh, a really good reminder. Um, and and again, this is this is why it's a data life cycle. It, you know, it's there is a uh, there's not an end to uh, or there you know it's not necessarily an end to the data after. Um, uh, at, you know, at the the last stage of that cycle, because there is a need for continual reevaluation, um, and and evolving technology is is a big part of that. Any other thoughts on this, uh, on the plan and design phase? I see a comment on uh, a late uh, comment in the challenges of, of people ignoring this stage entirely. Um, and I think that that is uh, certainly something that we're, I, you know, making progress on, but it is, uh, it is still a challenge to, to, um, to incentivize um, researchers to, to think about the, this as integral to, to the process. Um, does anyone want to share thoughts on, on how, how, how they um, have made this resonate with them, so how they have incorporated the plan and design phase into their own researcher or research or helped other researchers if you're if you support researchers in your work to to kind of think take this stage seriously in their research practice. Can I ask a question? 
I see a, a sticky note that says the people who quote need the information. I guess I'm not sure what that means because I, I work, my job is I work with, I'm a researcher myself, academically trained, but I predominantly work with communities. And the more you do, I, I'm not sure how you define need, especially when a lot of these problems and issues we're trying to solve are affecting more than one community or they're affecting the entire planet. So I guess I would just like some clarification because maybe I can learn something. I don't know. Yeah, Monica, that was me, um, Jessica. And it, it kind of went along with your comment that you voiced earlier about generally involving communities and making sure we're actually gathering the data and information that they need um, before going out and, and doing it and or entering their communities. Okay, thank you. Cause I didn't know if it was one of those like, you know, sometimes you hear scientists they are like, I'll have to dumb it down. They won't understand. And you're kind of like, I have to spend my whole career now like proving that I'm not like you and I'd rather not. Um, oh, no, so no, no. Not yeah. <laughs> so thank you for that. Hey Monica, I think uh, it also, this is Andrew. I think it also plays to the fact that when you're plan in the planning stages, planning for how people might use the data might change how you organize the data instead of thinking from a scientist perspective of this is how logically it makes sense to me. Instead thinking, who's the consumer of this data in reuse? How is it logical to them? They need the data. So that might change how I plan the data management. That's beautiful. Thank you. And sorry, Jess, I didn't want to like accuse you, Jessica, but I think we all know those researchers where you're like, eh. Well, I like, as I said, I really like how we, we a lot of these do seem to, uh, uh, to crystallize on that theme of thinking about the um, thinking of, about the end the, this end use end user broader uses of of data as early as the the very first stages of conceptualizing um, a, a study and and planning for your data collection. Any other thoughts before we we move to the next? phase. Hi, this is Madison Langsa. Um, just a comment on like challenges with getting buy-in and, and things like that. I think that I think things are getting better. I think as researchers are understanding and like the need you know, they're they're being required to or, or understanding the benefit of publishing data as they go through that process once and realize, you know, find out where the challenges were, they start to see the benefits of planning. So it's it's kind of like a live and learn kind of thing that I think um, it will evolve over time. And and more, but like if if fo like folks in data manager roles or librarian roles can like kind of help folks see that, like see where they're stumbling and how maybe. Earlier, it could have been easier to, to do it and think about it this way. It might help the next project to, to take the planning a bit more seriously. Great point. All right. Um, uh, one more a comment uh, from the chat that uh, buy-in is difficult with researchers who are who are you know late career, uh, who you know are are not as interested in changing practices, or researchers who are skeptical of getting scooped, um, which is is definitely a um, that that certainly is a a big issue, um, especially when we're talking about open data sharing. Um, 
and we will we'll have uh, more opportunities as we talk about the the kind of sharing stage, the uh, access and reuse stages, um, to to talk a little bit more about that. All right. Well, our board is practically full, so that uh, means it's time to move to the next um, the next slide. Collect and analyze. So I've taken the liberty of merging collect and create and, anal and analyze uh, for the purposes of this next Jamboard, just in the interests of time and, and consolidating some of our comments. Um, uh, and um, and because I, I think some of this is uh, there are some overlapping um, guidance and tips that um, that I think are, are pertinent to share together. So I think the in in thinking about the collect uh, collect and create and analyze stages of the data lifecycle, thinking about the potential for reuse and uh, and and the potential for open data to support open science. The two key things that that come to mind are documenting protocols and context for the data collection and or generation and analysis. Um, so we future users are going to want to know as much detail as possible about instrument calibrations, about uh, weather conditions in uh, for for gathering data um, in situ, um, uh, value definitions and codebook. Um, a, a summary of the of the experimental protocols um, uh, links to um, uh, to you know any to previous data collection efforts that are that are similar you know all of the as much context as you can possibly document in the process of gathering and analyzing the data um, in an, in analysis that context also will will also likely include. Um, code or scripts that that are used for for the data analysis or any other kind of relevant context for uh, that would enable another researcher to reproduce the analysis. Um, and this also involves th this. Uh, so this may um, be documented in 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 the data management plan. Or it may be documented uh, in in another type of document. It might in, uh, and it, many. Uh, in many cases, it might be useful to start reporting this in a README file as early as possible. So starting starting a draft README that you intend to include with the data package that you publish or archive um, so that it uh, that all of that context is is there for future uh, for future users. Um, so let's uh, uh, let's hop back over to the Jamboard. Um, if you um, navigate uh, at the top of your screen to the next slide, you'll see we have a collect and analyze board, a nice fresh board uh, with just my, my planted uh, inspiration comment here. Um, and you can get started in populating this next one. So thinking about who are the role, who is involved in collecting and analyzing data in a project and what types of roles do they play? What are the barriers at this stage um, when uh, collecting data that impact the uh, potential of the data to be shared and reused? Um, and what are the outcomes? What happens uh, when, when we do this, this part well? I love that metadata golden rule, provide as much metadata for others as, as you would like others to provide for you. I'm sorry, I um, stepped away for a moment. Oh, can you repeat where, what exercise are we, how are we modifying it this time? 
Sure. So this, uh, this we're on the collect and analyze board. So that's slide two of five in the Jamboard. Um, and your your uh, comments should relate to how how uh, your efforts at the collect the data collection and analysis stage relate to making the the data suitable for sharing and reuse. I see. Understood. Thank you. I see a lot of challenges being added. This part is is really hard thinking about how I, I like this idea. There's a difference between transparent and usefully transparent. So you can you can make all of this open, but does that make it legible to another researcher? Um, not necessarily. And and how that that communication gap is is really challenging to cross. I like the the diversity of positive outcomes that that I see here too. You know, the amazing data that everyone wants to use and gets cited. You know, these the great you know the the great aspiration of of open science, and then also you know the the kind of daily um, uh, uh, nuisance of getting emails that you don't to asking how <laughs> asking questions about the data that you don't remember how to answer. I see a lot of barriers that <clears throat> that relate to, to to the you know lack of time to uh, to properly get organized and uh, and car you know carve out time to focus on this or make this a priority um, to think about to to keep that future future user in mind when when the focus is on what do I need to do today what do I need to do to get my uh, my article published to get my uh, my grant report in, um, et cetera, um, as well as uh, you know uh, lack of training um, in reproducible analysis tools as well, um, uh, and other you know areas where there's just a lack of of the knowledge and skills required to um, uh, to successfully uh, collect and analyze data in in reproducible ways. Would anyone like to comment on the on any of the thoughts they added here or ask a question about a thought that someone else added? I'm curious if anyone has has tips or thoughts on this this idea of um, of the difference between being transparent and usefully transparent, or the or the or that it's hard to curate data in ways that others can actually digest? Are there strategies that you use or um, or advise to uh, to help accomplish that? Is that a an unrealistic expectation uh, that you know? Is that something that that what are you know what are the um, what sets the stage for that to be possible for it to be possible for for someone to um, uh, for, for for a data set to provide usefully transparent information. Carl, yeah. Sure, you know, it, it's interesting because I think it's an audience and a time challenge um, because, you know, in the bulk of my experience working with researchers, uh, both in, you know, sort of early career researchers and students in classrooms and then doing consultation with researchers, often we don't have the time to really make uh, measurable progress on what is really a cultural shift and a 
substantial change in practice for established researchers. Um, so that's turned out to be a much heavier lift than I ever hoped. For students, especially when I have a longer term engagement, whether it's in a classroom or more extended consultation, I'll often start with um, an activity where we go out or they go out and actually try to find data to use on their particular project. And we have a conversation about the usability, discoverability, um, understanding of those data um, as a way to open the conversation about what is, what is good documentation, what is good structure, essentially those things that we hope will come out of a research activity in terms of data and documentation that enable it to be reused. But that's, a, that's something that we don't often have a chance to do in our short consultations. It's more of a uh, extended practice activity. That's a, that's a great point. It really it is. It's a culture shift. It's a it's not something that's going to be easy to to give a, a you know twenty minute training session on and and send people on their way. Uh, Megan, gosh, I don't even know if this is the right time to insert this, but I've been doing some basic data equity training lately, trying to become more informed about it, and so I've been learning a lot about. Um, what data equity is and how you use quantitative data so that it aligns with the intended experience of the people that you care about. And so we all make hundreds, probably more than that cho of choices in the process of doing research. That's what we're talking about. Um, and you can do it in a way where you're transparent, but you can also do it in a much harder way, which is where you're doing it in line with what your data equity goals actually are. So thinking very early on about who are the people you're most trying to center and how are you going to make sure that the data you collect are not actually unintentionally hurting people in some way. And so I know it's not maybe 100% in line with the question that you're asking right now, but definitely came to mind um, at this moment. I think it's very relevant. And it's it certain again, I think it's 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 another question that is asking those questions up front in these early stages it is critical because it has, again, implications on sharing, uh, you know, what if if I'm collecting data about um, vulnerable populations, am I doing so in a way that it that is, um, and I intend to share it at the end, am I doing so in an ethical and responsible way in a way that is um, that is um, accountable to to the, the communities I'm working with. Um, it, there's there's all sorts of, of ways that those questions have that asking those questions in, in the early stages of the data life cycle um, is critical for um, for um, for ensuring you know your eth ethical open science practices throughout the the other stages. Uh, Sky Sky. Uh, yeah. Um, real quick, I'm the one who posted the note on the usefully transparent stuff, so I thought I'd respond on that. So, um, you know, as scientists, we actually love to tell our analytical stories and our data collection stories awesome. and our data wrangling stories. Um, it's just the way that we usually tell those is in a highly curated form, either through uh, prose as we as we document the science and, and document the work or uh, through conference presentations or through seminars or through those kind of more uh, formal routes. And I think um, where we're, we're at today is there are tools and methods and techniques and developing training around how to capture more of that analytical process and those analytical stories as a natural byproduct of the scientific process. And it's gonna take a little bit of time to catch that up, but I think it's useful when we think about it in that grand scheme of um, the utility of telling the story of the science that we're doing anyway. Uh, sometimes there is a secret sauce kind of dynamic that comes up, but uh, for the most part, it's something that we enjoy doing anyway. It's it's really a part of the process. And as we look to improve that process moving forward and use uh, new techniques and methods that make more of that story uh, visible, um, I think we need to think about it in a in a continuum of, of something that's really already a natural part of, of what we do. I, I love that idea. And I <clears throat> that seems very related to 
to Carl's comment about the culture shift, I mean, that's that seems like part of the culture shift maybe is um, instead of making this just an onerous kind of task, making it, framing it more as a natural extension of the research process and maybe something that uh, the researchers can even come to enjoy doing um, because it gives them the opportunity to, to tell those stories. I'm seeing you know, several comments about uh, about the lack of training for, especially for early career researchers in in data management. And um, yeah, I think there's still a lot of, of work to to do to um, um, to make sure that that all graduate students are are getting that you know at, at, as soon as they they can in their training. Um, Monica, do you do you want to expand at all on the on your comment about um, you know about communication and and how that relates to how we <laughs> information? Sure. Um, well, I'll be honest. I mean, and maybe you all have felt this way too. Some presentations are boring, right? Someone is very monotone. They're very soft spoken, and they've got three hundred slides when they've told they've had fifteen minutes, right? And my, one of my committee members almost didn't sign my dissertation because he said I fluctuated my voice too much when I was defending my dissertation. Now, there are some cultural things about that. You know, Black culture, we do tend to speak like that. Um, but I always think it's funny because now the Union of Concerned Scientists trains me to teach scientists to speak more with fluent, you know, fluctuating voices. Oh yeah, my grad advisor had to beg him to sign my dissertation. Um, but I mean, but we know the amygdala and how that works with working memory. And that if you can, you can remember things that are, are emotional. So we know the different parts of the brain that are engaging, but it seems like we're taught to communicate in a way that's just the opposite. Um, and I'm not trying to speak against people who are neuro, neurodivergent or, or anything, but as a whole, we're taught to speak in a way that doesn't match the way our brain works. And I, I still don't understand that. Um, but like I said, I, I, he did sign my dissertation and I have not spoken to him since, so. That, that's an awful, awful story. I'm sorry to, that, that that happened to you. Um, and, but, but I think, uh, but your point is well taken that, um, that that's, I think that's one of the other skills too, that's, that's, uh, you know, in some, some other things were alluded to in the challenges about lack of training for various things. And I think, you know, in communication is, is probably uh, among those that, um, that, uh, that's not a, something that is commonly enough um, taught, whether written or oral communication um, for, for researchers. Are there any other um, any other comments or um, or does anyone else want to elaborate on anything else that um, any other the other thoughts here? All right, well, we will we will return to the Jamboard um, after we talk about um, evaluate, evaluating and archiving. Um, so uh, ev evaluation and archive archiving is a, a kind of precursor to um, to sharing or access and re and reuse um which and it's really the process of determining what what data um should be retained what data should be stored um kind of processing some of the data some data life cycle models call this stage processing or have some sort of or have uh, you know part of this stage is also processing the data um so beyond analysis um doing uh you know considering um uh 
identifying the retention requirements for, for the data or a subset of the data that has been collected and analyzed. Retention requirements might be, um, be determined by the, the type of data uh, and, and its potential for reuse or its significance. It might be determined by a funder policy or an institutional policy um, or other, other motivations for, um, for retention, but it's important to pay attention to those if they exist um, and the data needs to be retained. Um, at this stage, uh, another key element is thinking about suitability for sharing. So that's something that has, has likely come up in previous stages of the process and of the life cycle, and we've talked about it a little bit in our discussion so far, but this is really the point to determine suitability for sharing, making sure that you're identifying any ethical or legal concerns with sharing um, and determining which, if any, parts of the data can be safely shared openly um, and, uh, and can be suitably de-identified or anonymized if, if it's human subjects data or if it's other types of sensitive information um, or if there are other ethical or legal concerns with sharing. It's also a, a great time to be thinking about licensing options for data. Um, uh, in general, uh, I'll, I'll give my plug here for CC0 licensing, and, and we can talk more about that in the discussion if, if folks have thoughts. At Dryad, we oblige the use of a Creative Commons zero public domain dedication uh, or license. And while some research communities remain reluctant to waive all of their restrictions, especially the attribution requirement, we strongly believe that CC0 is the most effective way to remove barriers to reuse. And Creative, Creative Commons itself asserts that putting a database, database or data set in the public domain is a way to remove any legal doubt about whether researchers can use the data in their projects. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and we also, uh, uh, you know, in general, um, raw data on their own are considered facts and thus can't, can't re truly be copyrighted. So we, it, Dryad strongly encourages CC, or Dryad requires CC0 for any data that we publish, and we encourage it um, whenever, whenever it is, is legally and ethically appropriate um, for data sets to remove barriers and, uh, and potential risks for reusers of the data. Um, uh, and this is also if if it hasn't come up already in the first two stages, and I think we've seen through the the Jamboard activity that that hopefully it has. But if if uh, if the uh, this is a great time to reflect on the potential for reuse when considering what what data, what subset of data um, should be um, should be published or archived, and uh, and and um, under what licenses and what conditions. Um, let's hop back over to the Jamboard and um, and take a look at your thoughts here. So we are on. Oops. Slide three of five in the Jamboard. Um, I see there's there's already some some thoughts uh, thoughts here. So this is a clearly a topic that is is generating um, some um, some interest already. I'm seeing some CC0 uh, support in the comments. Um, Don says the OSDP policy is very clear about using the most open, unrestricted license uh, that's uh, possible, um, and CC0 meets that expectation. Um, and, and Carl says that it reflects the reality that, um, that, that citation is better required through expectations and ethical research behavior than the norms of, of scholarship rather than a, um, than a license. I like the, the comment that archivist is a real profession that's different from research scientists. Don't expect the latter to think like the former. And I think you know, that's that's why this session is called collaborative support for the open data life cycle. There, all of these perspectives are valuable. And I do think that's, you know, the 
the expectation is not that every individual needs to have all of the skills and all of the perspectives that are necessary uh, and useful for the, the data life cycle, but that it is a collaborative effort and that those differing perspectives, maybe sometimes at odds perspectives, are, are critical in, in, um, in providing all of the, um, the context that's and, um, and expertise that's necessary. Robert. Uh, do, do you have your hand raised, uh, Robert? Did you want to make a comment? Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, but I was wondering if I could make a question or is there or is that better for a, a question section? Absolutely. Go ahead. Um, I I have some, so uh, my focus area is on specific, uh, or I should say a broad space uh, space topic, or I should say multiple topics in the, in the, in the general space area. And um, there's a number of uh, data, data types and data sources that um, can use uh, a lot of your point, a lot of the points that you raised today. Uh, and I'm wondering if there is, or if you have suggestions, and if you have maybe pointers to uh, formal support for bringing your points and these ideas uh, to those specific communities. And uh, that's one part of the question. And then the second part is um, I'll put some links in the chat for uh, some examples of the specific uh, sorts of uh, space data, uh, as well as my uh, personal project for which I'm seeking support. Uh, in line with what some of your ideas here uh, about the importance of open um, open data collaboration and, and that sort of thing. So to restate the question, are there um, is there forms of support to bring your points here to uh, specific communities in uh, in this case in the space sector? It's it's a great question. I don't know that I can fully answer it um, uh, without you know on the spot, but um, I, I think there there it depends on your context. Um, you know, uh, I I will put in a plug for for the library as a great source of support if you're affiliated with uh, with an institution that has um, a data management uh, uh, librarian or um, you know other forms of data support through the library. Um, other uh, there are. Um, a number of different organizations that provide best practices guidance, um, the, the Digital Curation Center, um, the Research Data Alliance, there, there, you know, are, uh, there's no short of, sh shortage of high quality information that, and training that covers a lot of the, um, the ideas that I've talked about today. Um, and uh, I'll also mention the, the White House Year of Open Science, um, which was announced uh, in, in January, and it's really being led by, by NASA and their Transform to Open Science program, um, uh, or TOPS. Uh, I, can, I can try to dig up a, a link, or maybe one of the, the fellows could help me dig up a link for the TOPS program. Um, and TOPS is is really committed to um, you know especially for um, for uh, space data to uh, empowering researchers to adopt open science practices um, uh, and um, uh, through training activities and uh, grants and other other types of of initiatives. So that that might be a great resource for you. Just catching up on on the comments in the chat. Some good good discussion about uh, continuing discussion about CC zero and um, and uh, how you know how it uh, and its its impacts and um, Are there any other any other thoughts or questions about uh, uh, anything here?
All right, I'm going to um, to move us back over to the slides um, and we'll move to our the last phase. I've again uh, for for the in the interest of time, I've combined the um, the the last two phases into sharing and reuse instead of uh, sharing and and access and reuse. Um, and and so I'll talk about I have you know I have this is is kind of the heart of what Dryad does and uh, and and what I'm I'm passionate about. So I have a few more more tips uh, in this one than um, than for some of the other life cycle stages. Um, and then we will we'll do our final Jamboard to conclude. Um, so going back to to thinking about the about open data sharing policies this is these are some of the the points from the NIH policy i imagine you know I, we expect other government agencies to follow suit their policies might look similar to NIH's you know including funders that that fund more um, earth science related data um, and the NIH expects that um, that when sharing data that researchers will will maximize, as they say, the appropriate sharing of scientific data. And what they mean by appropriate sharing is the use of established repositories. So not putting your data up on Google Drive and providing an open link, but actually depositing it with a trusted repository that, um, that meets a number of, of very specific criteria for, um, for data management. They also expect timely publication. So again, they they expect data to to be published uh, before the conclusion of the grant period, or you know, at the time of the publication of a related research article, not embargoed uh, uh, and and thus inaccessible for other researchers for a, an extended period of time. And they expect data quality assurance. So we've talked, we've alluded to this a little bit in that uh, 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 several of you pointed to the um, that as a missing piece in the data life cycle diagram, this uh, QA piece. Um, we think of that uh, in, uh, in, in Dryad, that's part of our curation process. So uh, you may, that, you know, that's another term that is often used um, when talking about data quality assurance or me and metadata quality assurance. Um, and so all of these are, are really important to keep in mind when thinking about where and how to share data and how to prepare data for being shared. Um, so some things to keep in mind when preparing to share data, gathering all relevant data needed for reanalysis. So thinking about, uh, about um, uh, taking stock of all of the data that's been gathered uh, and uh, gathered or generated in the course of the study, um, <clears throat> as well as inventorying related research outputs that give essential context or provide additional um, uh, materials that are needed to, to process uh, or analyze the data. Um, uh, we, um, at Dryad, we encourage researchers to add persistent identifiers for these outputs. Um, so again, uh, making data part of a larger network of open knowledge, open research outputs that can be persistently accessed and reliably accessed over time. Um, so for example, linking a data set to an article that references it to um, software that's needed to analyze it to an other data sets that uh, resulted from, from the, state, the same study, um, et cetera, um, provides the context that other researchers will need in order to interpret it, reproduce it, interact with it um, in, in various ways. Um, and, uh, 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 and, and reviewing, so, and then the third stage here is reviewing your README and other metadata that you have already started to prepare um, in the data management plan, in the, the collect and analyze process as you started to prepare that README file for uh, compliance with best practices um, and, and making sure that it's up to date and accurate as you start, as you prepare um, for publication. Um, the um, uh, so the you know the metadata that um, is contained in the README 
um, is also an opportunity to provide additional contextual information that may not be available in the repository uh, as a as a field in the repository where you're submitting the data. So it's an opportunity to pro provide discipline specific metadata if you're submitting to a generalist repository. It's an opportunity to provide more of that narrative um, uh, exploration of methods and usage notes um, that that might not be um, be collected elsewhere in a submission process. Um, and I think I'm actually going to uh, to skip to this this slide um, so that we can get back to our collaborative activity. Um, and so thinking about different forms of reuse, um, we've talked about a little bit about this kind of theme in some of the discussions so far, um, but thinking about different ways that the data might be reused. So data might be re reused to, uh, data might be used to reproduce findings. So meaning um, uh, using the original researcher's data as found in a repository to regenerate results, see if, if those, those same results can um, can be generated. Replicability, meaning um, collecting new data to try to arrive at the same conclusion, which also requires being able to reference the original data collection. It might be repurposing data to generate novel findings, completely you know, unexpected or, or unrelated uses of the data to the original research questions. Performing meta-analyses, so connecting the data to other um, to other data sets and, and performing uh, analysis on those. Um, and, and even things like seeding machine learning algorithms. Um, so, uh, so thinking about, uh, you know, a, there are an infinite number of, of ways that others might reuse data. It's impossible to anticipate all of them, um, but I'm curious to hear from you in the Jamboard. I think that's one of the things that I'll be interested to see if you have thoughts on is how um, how our practices might enable these different kinds of reuse differently. So let's jump over to the final board. Uh, here we go. Um, so slide four or five, share and reuse. And I see some folks have already gotten started sharing sharing some thoughts here. I like the mention here of, of in the outcomes of releasing all data, even if it didn't end up contributing to findings or research questions uh, with the idea that other researchers may be able to use it. That's that's something that we hadn't hadn't talked about so far, but that's a you know, that's one of the the promises, I think, of open data sharing is that um, that there are unexpected uses that that may be quite different from what the original uh, researcher intended um, for their own their own purposes. And if you can think of other kinds of free use that I didn't mention in the, in the list, I'm curious to hear what other what other interesting examples of reuse or, or types of reuse you've encountered. Well, you can continue to uh, to add to this uh, this board as you like, uh, if you like. Um, in the meantime, I I want to invite you to take a, one final. Poll um, and let me know what your top takeaways from this session were. Um, did you learn anything new? Will you change anything about your own research practice based on what we've learned? Um, uh, were there there any discussion points that you found particularly um, particularly salient? And. Um, I uh, want to thank all of you also for your participation. It was uh, great to see so much engagement with the jam boards and all of the wonderful ideas that you shared. Um, and I, I really appreciate all of the the participation and and your um, and your willingness to share your thoughts. Great. so so folks learned learned some things on kind of new perspectives on the data life cycle, reminder about the importance of data licenses, lots of energy and a lot of ways that we can collectively contribute to challenges and opportunities. Concept of data empathy and the metadata golden rule. I really like those too. Those are, those are really great kind of uh, mnemonic devices as, as uh, you're engaging in the data life cycle. principles. 
still some ambivalence about it, about license, licensing. I don't know that that will ever go away. <laughs> Well, thank you again. Uh, thank you, Megan um, and the ESIP fellows for help in organizing the session, making sure that everything ran smoothly and, and helping out with links and everything. I really appreciate that. And um, thanks to all of you for participating. Thank you God, very much, Sarah. This was extremely well organized and I'm excited to see the contributions from everyone. And don't forget to join us for the Coffee Break Networking. It's starting in about 15 minutes in our wonder space it'll be a great chance to meet our community fellows and to chat informally maybe continue this topic but there are lots of other ones too <laughs>